I'd like to introduce to you my brothers and sister in arms uh, with whom I collaborated on this research. That is from Denmark, Jens Otto Andersen from the Biodynamic Research Association Denmark, Claudia Scher from the Verein für Krebsforschung, and Stefan Baumgartner from the Institute of Integrative Medicine, University of Wittenherdecke in Germany. As has been pointed out uh, the last few days uh, by several speakers, um, for basic homeopathic research, we require stable and reliable test systems to detect any biological effect of homeopathic preparations. And to this end, we described in 2012 uh, a bioassay which revealed specific effects of a standard metallicum D30 preparation, tin D30, compared to water D30 as control. Um, for this bioassay, which consists out of two parts, uh, I, will, I will shortly explain. The first part consists out of cress seed germination, and to this end, we uh, allowed cress seeds to germinate on paper filters, which were soaked in either of the two preparations at forehand. These paper filters were placed in plastic zipper bags and hung vertically in a heating cabinet at 19 degrees Celsius, 19 degrees Celsius for 96 hours. And after that time, the crest seedlings had reached an average length of about 9 centimeters. Now, the second part of the essay is that we set out to detect the systemic properties or the differences between the systemic properties of these two groups of seedlings. And for this, we harvested the seedlings, uh, made an extract of the seedlings, and added them to a petri dish already containing, or containing a solution of copper chloride. Copper chloride. Uh, this solution was allowed to evaporate and crystallize under standardized cl climatic conditions resulting in highly specific crystallization patterns, <coughs> copper chloride crystallization patterns or copper chloride fingerprint patterns, uh, which were uh, highly specific for standard metallic D30 or the control. Uh, and the reasoning behind adding this second step, uh, this, this fingerprint analysis, was based on, on a, 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 a very nice report of Nani et al. in 2007, who postulated a systematic mode of action of potentized substances, which was thought to promote homeostasis. So that's why we added this, this fingerprint analysis to specifically look at the uh, systemic properties of these two groups of seedlings. And you can imagine that uh, compared to a systemic property analysis, that unidimensional analysis like uh, growth rate or, or, or root and shoot length might not always be as receptive as, as something which can catch these systemic properties. So, a little sidestep about this crystallization fingerprint analysis, otherwise you don't really know what I'm talking about. Uh, it's been used mainly as an indicator for systemic properties in food analysis since the 1930s, mainly in biodynamic agriculture. The results, as you can see here, uh, which are obtained are two-dimensional dendritic crystallization patterns and the crystallization patterns emerge through a self-organization process of the copper chloride crystal needles. But the organization of these copper chloride needles is influenced by the properties of the additive, which we add to this copper chloride solution. So in this case, is uh, uh, influenced by the extracts of these two seedling groups. Well, just to briefly show you our experimental setup, we have a more than man-sized big crystallization chamber, and within this chamber we have petri dishes with a high rim which is fixed onto them, uh, in, and we have 43 petri dishes for one experiment. And just to give you an idea of these systemic properties, I just brought two samples along. Um, here's an, 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 an um, example of aging characteristics of carrot juice. So here we have fresh carrot juice crystallized with copper chloride, and here the same carrot juice after seven days storage in the fridge. And when you zoom in, you see that the difference even a lot clearer. <coughs> the fresh juice is able to organize. So what you see here are the copper chloride crystal needles. Mm -hmm. The fresh juice is able to organize the copper chloride crystal needles to a high degree of, uh, of organization, while after seven days aging of the, the carrot juice, uh, it's very well, it's really reduced in its ability to organize the crystal needles. 
The same is found for uh, the effect of different farming systems, which was the origin of the, the method. Uh, here are two examples of wheat extract from a standardized control trial from my colleague Jürgen Fritz. Um, wheat extract from a conventional origin and wheat extract from a biodynamic origin. And I think you can see directly already the difference in the organizational potential of these two extracts on the copper chloride solution. And in fact, this extract we used was 12 days aged. And if I zoom in, you see the difference a lot clearer. So apparently, after aging the, the wheat extract for 12 days in the fridge, the biodynamic wheat extract was still, to a high degree, uh, able to organize the copper chloride crystal needles, whereas this potential was severely lost by the conventional wheat extract. But I must add, this is not an authentic authentication test for, for uh, organic agriculture. So the plates are uh, evaluated in two ways. Visually, human visual evaluation according to adapted ISO norms for sensory analysis panels and via computerized image analysis. And for this we mainly uh, apply a texture analysis algorithm, or at least in this study we apply the texture analysis algorithm. <coughs> and texture analysis, or this algorithm, describes local spatial variations in neighboring pixel gray level intensities in the pattern. So you can imagine this crystallization pattern, which is in fact only nine centimeters in diameter, uh, is scanned and we look at the pixel level and we look at the, the gray level intensity of neighboring pixels. And for this we, we construct a gray level co-occurrence matrix. And from this matrix 15 variables are calculated, but for this study our, our variable of primary interest is called cluster shade. And cluster shade um, shows the degree of asymmetry in the texture of the patterns. Well, we can look at different regions of interest for the, the primary questions, if we can see a difference between, between the crystallization plates of the two seedling groups, we look at the whole plate, and later on we try to pinpoint where the signal was found predominantly by looking at different sections of the crystallization plates. So back to the homeopathic setup. This is the setup for one experimental day. We performed in total 15 experiments, eight in Denmark, seven in Holland. Uh, we started off with three potencies of standard metallicum D30 and three potencies of water D30. Uh, they were blinded and randomized and what we were delivered were coded samples A to F. Seedlings were allowed to germinate on these preparations and from each preparation, six crystallization plates replicates were produced. So for each experimental day, we had 18 crystallization plate replicates from the standard metallicum group and 18 for the, from the water group. And this uh, experimental design had one extra feature was what made it really interesting. In, if this is the processing order, so this is the first and this is the last to be processed, we combined the first processed standard metallicum potency with the first processed water as one group and compared it with the second group and the third group to look at the experimental stability. So you can imagine we, uh, we hoped that if we have an experimental stable design that we find no significant differences between these three pairs uh, of water metallicum. So this is the outcome of the precursor experiment. Experimental number seven performed in Holland, Louis Bork Institute, and eight in Denmark. This is the cluster shade reading and what you clearly see in red is that standard metallicum in both laboratories shows an increased level of cluster shade meaning an increased level of asymmetry in the texture of the crystallization patterns. What also is interesting is that you have a high degree of variation per experimental day certainly in this area but this was caused by an extremely hot period in the summer when these experiments were performed. And like Maria Olga Kokonacci showed yesterday in a droplet evaporation uh, um, method, uh, where she also showed a an, an highly significant experimental day effect, uh, I think we can rule out this, this variation in the experimental day, but that probably will also rule out the discriminative ability of the method. So it's, it's trying to balance between two aspects, uh, day variation versus discriminative ability. So it's, it's trying to find a balance in between. Well, ANOVA results of course a highly significant experimental day effect, but also a highly significant 
pulsing treatment effect, and the internal replicates were non-significant, which was evident from exp stable experimental design. And we found the, the signal was predominantly found around the geometrical center of the crystallization patterns. So then we continued with the uh, HUM2 of the, the, the replication experiment, and we had three goals. Of course, we wanted to reproduce the specific effects found in the precursor experiment, and we, we tried to optimize this assay. So we added a systematic negative control experiment besides the theorem experiments, and we exchanged water D30 for lactose D30 to control for the trituration of stannum up to D4. Uh, and we had a couple of other alterations to optimize the procedure. And but that's between brackets, but I won't discuss it. We also, in the same project, tried to de detect the effect of heat treatment and cell phone radiation on these two preparations. So the experimental design for the theorem experiments is slightly different from the precursor experiments. Now we only have one set of standard metallicum and lactose D30. This is the untreated set, and these two won't be discussed. This is the treatment with autoclavation or heat treatment and cell phone treatment. And this has a consequence that we only have six plates for the standard metallicum group and six plates for the lactose group. Ten experiments were performed in Holland, ten in Denmark, uh, mounting to 240 plates in total. So we had a reduction of the statistical power, of course, going from 540 plates to 240 plates. And uh, we had a higher degree of scatter. You would imagine if we only have, for one experiment a day, six plates instead of 18 plates, as we had in the precursor experiment. This is the systematic negative control design. Water D1, six plates. And this was uh, randomized in the same way as the theorem experiments. And the whole project was randomized in two ways, that we were not aware if we were working with uh, the systematic negative controls. And here also we performed 10 experiments in Holland and 10 in Denmark. So we were unaware if we were working with systematic negative controls or unaware if we were working with uh, the actual theorem experiments. Well, I'll just sum up the results of the replication trial. Uh, we found the same data structure locally in both projects, meaning a reproduction of the significant differences between the two preparations. And very importantly, the systematic negative control experiments show no significant intraday, interday, or interlap differences, indicative of a robust and reproducible test system. And here we have all the results summed up. So the precursor experiment, data of Holland, data of Denmark, and the replication experiment, data Denmark, data Holland. And what you clearly see is that you have a higher degree of stat scatter. So this is the mean, day mean with the standard error around it. We have a higher degree of scatter because of our different experimental design. Six plates per experimental day instead of 18 plates in the precursor experiment. And we have more inversions. So this is the relative treatment effect we're looking at. Stannum divided by the control. So here we had two effect inversions, two days with an effect inversion, and then here we have more days with an effect inversion, but also days with a stronger treatment effect. And what was very interesting is that the mean relevant treatment effect for the different projects was really comparable. 0.92 for the precursor experiment and 0.93 for the replication experiment. And again, also in the replication experiment, we found that the degree of asymmetry was higher with the stannum treated uh, crest seedling crystallization fingerprints. Well, the meta analysis was really very nice. Looking again at cluster shade, there's a degree of asymmetry. We find a highly significant experimental day effect when we pooled the data of precursor and replication trial. And we find a highly significant treatment effect and no interaction between experimental day and treatment. And again, the signal predominantly was located in a geometrical center of the crystallization patterns. So to round up, it seems like the Crest Seedling Crystallization Fingerprint Assay, although it's a whole mouthful and it's a pretty complicated assay, yields reproducible biological effects of an ultramolecular homeopathic preparation. These results point to a promising potential of the method to contribute to basic homeopathic research. 
Uh, for instance, establishing the resilience of the potentized preparations to uh, physical influences like heat treatment and electromagnetic cell phone radiation, as we have set up to do this in the same project. And like Kirsten Endler just mentioned before, we have submitted this data of this replication trial to a mainstream journal, and it is a very hard road to go. So we've been rejected three times now already on what we think are not really reasonable grounds. But thank you for your attention.